I'm very pleased to welcome you all back and to welcome Dr. Kevin Key, who will present today's Big Thinking Lecture. The goal of our Big Thinking Lecture uh, series is to bring research from the social sciences and humanities closer to the people who can use it, to inform discussions and decisions about politics and policies that affect the lives of Canadians. And what's interesting is that normally our Big uh, Thinking Lecture uh, series take place either at Congress uh, during the, um, the annual uh, event or in Ottawa, where we have a monthly uh, series on Parliament Hill that Chad alluded to, Chad Gaffield, um, and where we engage policymakers directly in the policy community in Ottawa. This is part of sort of the richness of getting the message out about what we do to a wider group of people, so across disciplines um, and across even local communities, as we do with the big thinking lectures at the Congress, and of course with our policy communities in Ottawa. But today we've taken the big thinking lecture on the road with us uh, to the annual conference in Montreal. And the idea is also to have someone from our community, from our scholarly community, talk to us about how his research is in effect transformative and how he is also being transformed as a researcher in the process. And what he's going to talk to us about this afternoon is how we can change knowledge production and redraw the boundaries that define scholarship. And we've had a theme all day about these transformative issues in our universities, in our associations, and so Kevin is going to speak to that uh, this afternoon. His talk is entitled Borders Without Boundaries, and it speaks to what he tries to do, but it also echoes the theme of Brock University's 2014 Congress of the Social Sciences and Humanities, and where Kevin uh, is a CRC chair. Not only is he CRC chair in digital humanities, Dr. Key is also associate by president research for the social sciences and humanities, and an associate professor in the Department of History and the Center for Digital Studies at Brock University. He's well known in his field, and really even outside of it as well, for his expertise on digital humanities, on research, and on development, and we're so pleased that he's taken time out of his very busy schedule as he helps prepare for Congress 2014 to join us in today's conversation. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Antonia. You may have grand plaisir. It's, it's a huge pleasure and an honor to speak with you today. I had the privilege of giving a talk along a similar line uh, several months ago, and as is my habit now, I took the text of my talk and I put it on the web, and I took the slides and I put them on the web so that they'd be publicly available. So truth be told, I wondered if you'd actually need me today. <laughs> Maybe the Federation could have gotten someone else local to read the speech and avoided my travel costs. But then I heard the story of Richard Feynman and his chauffeur. Some of you already know it. Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist who didn't like flying. And so Caltech gave him a limousine and a chauffeur to take him to his various speaking engagements across the United States. And after several weeks on the road, the chauffeur was driving and he said, you know, Professor Feynman, I've heard you give the same talk night after night after night. I swear to you, I could give this talk. And so Feynman said, you know what? the next university we're going to, I haven't met anybody there. So let's change clothes. You put on my suit, I'll put on your chauffeur's uniform, you give the talk, and I'll sit in the back row and watch. And so that's exactly what they did. And Feynman sat in the back row, and the chauffeur proceeded to the front, and he gave the talk beautifully. And there was a huge ovation at the end. And then a faculty member put up his hand, and he proceeded to ask a four-minute question that ended with, Professor, is it therefore true that the locus of the covariant tensor has a non-commutative divergence in the field of the transfinite singularity? And without missing a beat, the chauffeur said, Sir, in my many years of giving talks, I don't think I've ever heard a question so basic, so simple, 
In fact, the answer is so obvious, I'm going to ask my chauffeur in the back of the room <laughs> to answer it for me. The title of my talk, Borders Without Boundaries, or Frontières Sans Limites, is taken from the Congress of the Social Sciences and Humanities at Brock University in two months. And we're not clicking. Oh, there we go. And as you can see from the sea in Congress, you're going to be coming to wine country and there's going to be lots of red wine there for you. Now, the English is a bit confusing. Aren't borders and boundaries more or less the same thing? But the French makes it clear, this is a conference about scholarship without limits, limitless boundaries, frontières sans limites. And I like this title for three reasons. First, Borders Without Boundaries points to that which makes Brock unique. We're a 15-minute drive from the American border, providing opportunities for collaboration with colleagues in the United States. We're a comprehensive university with a, a thriving research culture and an abiding commitment to excellence in teaching. And we're a young institution. This year, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary of the founding of Brock. But at the same time, we have a respect for the past. And we're also celebrating the 200th anniversary of the end of the War of 1812, the war in which our university's namesake, Sir Isaac Brock, fought and died. Second, I like the title because it focuses attention on that which is best about Congress. It provides opportunities to share research with colleagues within our disciplinary borders, while also providing opportunities for us to go beyond them and to see other forms of knowledge and knowledge expression. And in this way, Congress fosters and instantiates the ever-changing boundaries of the social sciences and humanities. Third, and most important for me this afternoon, Borders without boundaries or limitless boundaries reminds us of our present historical moment, and we've heard that through the day. A few months ago, of course, Shirk and Canada's other major funding agencies released a consultation paper on digital scholarship. And it reminded us that, and we've heard it again and again today, we're in the midst of a paradigm shift brought about by the new digital technologies and interactive media. And this paradigm shift is forcing us to reconsider how we do what we do. So this morning we talked about how we do undergraduate education, and this afternoon we talked about how we do graduate education, and Chad talked about how we run the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. And so what I want to talk about is how we do scholarship. How do we do scholarship in this new digital age? Or to put it in another way, in the context of our Congress 2014 title, how do we redraw the boundaries that have previously defined and reinforced scholarship in the internet age where knowledge knows no boundaries. I want to address these questions by focusing on the essential practices of scholarship. So Therese this morning talked about, in the context of teaching, our teaching practices. Focusing on scholarship for a few minutes, our essential practices are researching, writing, publishing, and communicating. These practices, these ways of being a scholar, are changing as we know before our eyes. And I believe that if we negotiate those changes well, the result will be a newly energized social sciences and humanities at a time when sometimes our value, as we know and we've talked about today, is called into question. But that's going to require the collaboration of leading researchers such as you and the young, emerging, new generation of digital savvy researchers, the young men and women who are coming to Congress 2014 at Brock for the first time. I've been thinking about the young scholars who will arrive to their first Congress because I was that new arrival the last time Brock played host. So we've got uh, wine in 2014, and we've got a blank slide. Okay, thank you. Wine in 2014, we had the falls in 1996 when I got there. Congress 1996, new perspectives, nouvelle perspective. It marked my entrance into academe. It was the first Congress I attended, it was the first academic paper I gave, and I was nervous. <laughs> a couple of years ago, a student in my lab said, Dr. Key, you've got to come over, take a look at my screen. I found a picture of you when you looked young. <laughs> the scholarly practices by which I created and gave that paper in 1996 were well established. I researched primary and secondary sources in the libraries and archives, organizing my notes along the way. 
I wrote the paper, I delivered it at Congress, I sent it to a journal, and then I shared with the community what I'd learned. Research, write, publish, communicate. It was very straightforward. Now think for a moment about your first academic meeting and the scholarly practices that you followed when you presented or attended your first academic meeting. And then think about the young scholars who are arriving in their mid-20s to their first Congress next May, next May at Brock. And they tend to look about this young. They're arriving, as we know, and we've talked about today, at a time of uncertainty in the social sciences and humanities. And we've, we've talked about it, so I'm not gonna belabor the point. We know that we've had exceptional leadership from Chad and Antonia and others. But we also know that sometimes it's an uphill climb. When we think about influential newspaper columnists, they're called into question frequently the value of a social sciences and humanities degree. So Margaret Wente says that we're educating for unemployment. It's a landscape of death. And we also know, and we just talked about this, that the market isn't good to people who are just graduating now and want to come into the academy. According to HECO, the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, the number's about 25% who will succeed succeed according to getting a tenure track job. These challenges have forced us to think about what is required for a healthy social sciences and humanities for the new arrivals to Congress 2014 and for those who will follow. And the answers have been varied. Harvard has launched the Humanities Project and created a new curriculum. A host of respected scholars, such as Martha Nussbaum, have renewed calls for a liberal arts that actively contributes to citizenship. But what we've heard less about, and what I want to focus on for the next few minutes, is a careful consideration of the way in which we practice the social sciences and humanities. I believe that part of the reason that our value is called into question is because both the manner in which we work and the way that work is sometimes communicated seems divorced from our times. We know that part of the point of the academy is to be a separate space with clear boundaries hived off from the rest of the world. But we also know that we need to work with and speak to the world around us, one in which information knows no boundaries. In my field of digital humanities and digital history, we've been experimenting with how we produce knowledge since the dawn of computing, and we've tried new models of researching and writing and publishing and communicating. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit about what we've learned and what I think it means for knowledge production in 2014 at Congress and beyond. So let's begin with how we research. In 1996, when I was working on my PhD, when I went to Congress, I faced a scarcity of information and limited access to resources. And for all of us at that time, it was exactly the same. When I did my research, I had to do it in person, in places like the Douglas Library at Queens or the Burke's Reading Room here at McGill. And for those of you who've been to the Burke's, you'll know that when you go in, you have to leave your boots at the door because the floor is gorgeous and they don't want you to scratch the floor with their boots. So you can't see it, but those students sitting at those tables are actually in their socks. Now this kind of library and this kind of research method doesn't make any sense to the Congress arrivals in 2014. Their libraries, at least any that have been built or renovated in the last decade, look nothing like ours. Forget socks on the floor, the boots are on the table. <laughs> They've got coffee mugs and water bottles and food wrappers all over the place. And their biggest challenge is not, not having access to information. It's not scarcity. Now they, and indeed now all of us, face what the late American historian Roy Rosenzweig called a culture of abundance. And one might even say overabundance. We used to describe, you remember this? We used to describe the World Wide Web as a place where we had taken all the books and all the journal articles and all the magazines off the shelves of the library and we'd scattered them onto the floor. And those were the good old days. In 2003, researchers at Berkeley estimated that the amount of information created the previous year was about five exabytes. Now, if we printed five exabytes in traditional book form, those books would fill 37,000 libraries the size of the Library of Congress. A similar study a few years later estimated that Americans consumed 3.6 zettabytes in 2008. 
Now, if we printed 3.6 zettabytes, it would blanket the United States, including Alaska, to a depth of seven feet. We know that the online world is big in the same way that a fish knows that the ocean is big. It seems limitless every which way you turn. Now, before I go too far, I have to be honest, because we all know that a great deal of that 3.6 zettabytes is dedicated to cats. <laughs> Many of you know, but will not admit it, that this is Keyboard Cat, who is number two on the 50 greatest viral videos on the web, with tens of millions of views on YouTube. But for those of us who are humanists and social scientists who study culture and relationships within societies and societies, there's a lot there that also falls under the rubric of research material. And then, of course, there's all the newly digitized forms of traditional scholarship that are being added to the internet. So Google Books has said that um, they are going to digitize every single book published in modern history. And there are about 130 million books. And about the rate they're going, they're going to complete their work in our lifetimes. So in 2008, they had digitized 7 million, 2010, 12 million, 2012, 20 million, 2013, 30 million. This is going to happen soon. The challenge comes into view when we think about the work of an historian. My colleague Dan Cohen has pointed out that if a scholar wants to write a history of the Lyndon Johnson White House, she has to read and analyze the 40,000 memos issued during Johnson's administration. If an historian wants to write the history of the Clinton White House, any guesses as to the number of emails she has to read? Four million. There is no way that that scholar can read four million emails, never mind all of the other material that's related to the Clinton White House in her lifetime. So how then does she write the history? The situation will be worse for the scholars of tomorrow because they won't be able to say they've done a systematic literature review. As they begin to learn about the subject, the amount of information that will be generated about that subject will accumulate faster than the scholar can read and understand it. They'll be trying to drink from a fire hose. So we need to imagine a new way of doing scholarly research among these millions of books. And what processes might we use? My colleague at Western University, Bill Turkle, has an approach that he has called simply the method. And the method begins with an understanding that we can't go to our sources because there are and there will be far too many of them. So it follows that we need to find ways so that the information comes to us. And so what Bill has done is he has written with computer code, computer spiders and bots, and these go onto the World Wide Web, onto the internet. And what they do is they scrape relevant information from that vast internet ocean off. And then they bring the information back and they run it through a series of filters. And what those filters do is they check to see if the relevance of this document actually matches that which Bill has described in other ways, and if those documents match other documents. And then it makes a bit of a judgment call that Bill has programmed in to say, we're going to reject this material, and it goes in the garbage, or we're going to deposit it at a place where Bill, when he wakes up in the morning, can start to read it. And so with technologies and processes such as this, colleagues such as, as Bill and others are using text mining software to read those four million emails in the Clinton White House. They're using machine learning algorithms to process and analyze millions of books at a time. And they're using software to take that which is most important and create an index and build a concordance and cluster documents appropriately so they can then move to the next step and write up their findings. And when it comes time to express conclusions from our research, scholars have a multitude of options. But in 1996, I, we, had a simple choice when it came to how I was going to express the results of my research. I, I could choose print. It was hard to imagine doing scholarship any other way. A few minutes ago, I compared a scholar to a solitary fish swimming in a vast internet ocean. 
The late David Foster Wallace told the story of two young fish swimming along, and an older fish goes by them in the opposite direction. And as he goes by, the older fish says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a little bit longer. And then finally one turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? Print to us is like water to fish. It's hard to imagine any other way of producing knowledge. The American Historical Association last year said that history has been and remains a book-based discipline. And it goes without saying that there's much to be said for books. But restricting our expression of knowledge to print is making less sense with each passing day. Print, we know, carries inherent limits. And the limits of text are obvious, for instance, for those who are using contemporary oral history archives. So in 1996, I conducted interviews, I transcribed them, and then I quoted from those transcriptions in my articles and then later in my book. And my use of the interviews was several steps removed from the person who had spoken those words. As the historian Michael Frisch has noted, the deep, dark secret of oral history, the deep, dark secret of oral history is that nobody spends much time listening to or watching recorded and collected interview documents. But if a scholar wants to present her findings on the Holocaust at the 2014 Congress in eight weeks, and the scholar has used an archive, like the Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, she can now present her analysis alongside the actual video recorded testimony. She can include her analysis as well as the speaker's emotion and facial expression and tone of voice. Because watching Holocaust survivors speak of their experiences is very different from reading what they said. It might have the feel of a scholarly tour of the archive, and it's not book-based history, but it's scholarship all the same. Nor does history have to remain a book-based discipline in situations where we're relating historical information to place. So now that we can make maps digital, we can show change over time, and we can provide opportunities for users to explore specific information and relationships between different kinds of data as they relate to place. So this is a screenshot from the HyperCities project uh, that came out of USC and UCLA. And what they've done is, is they've taken all this information as it relates to, in this case, Berlin 1936, and put it in one space and geolocated it. Of course, you could write a book describing the relationships between the people and the places in Berlin 1936, and we do, and we have. But the creators of this Berlin hypercity have provided an opportunity to not only read the narrative that they created about what was happening at the time, but also to explore and to examine the sources that informed their narrative. The broadcast news clips, the archive photographs, the digital 3D constructions, and the video oral histories. And they've also provided opportunities for you to explore the relationships between those various kinds of knowledge and to find connections and to draw conclusions that perhaps they, the creators of the hypercity, hadn't even thought about. The production of scholarship raises the question of peer review and publication. How do we determine good scholarship in the age of audiovisual material or digital maps? And how do we best share it with others? In 1996, of course, this wasn't an issue. Following my paper presentation at Congress, I submitted my article to a top-tier journal, and we all know the processes that the article went through before it came out several years later in print. In 2014, and we've already alluded to this today, but in 2014, this system of peer review and publication is coming under pressure for a variety of reasons, and I'm just going to talk about two. The first, as I've already said, is there are new forms of digital scholarship. So audiovisual interviews or interactive maps are hard to communicate on paper in a journal such as this. And the second is that a lot of material, as we know, is being posted directly to the web, bypassing the careful gatekeeping of these journals. I'm not suggesting right now any kind of end to the careful, curated scholarship of established journals and academic presses. What I am suggesting is that we also support alternative ways of communicating knowledge to our peers, ways that are responsive to some of the pressures that we've talked about today. New arrivals can take advantage of some of these new pathways to publication. 
So my colleagues in the digital humanities have embraced scholarly blogging and they've recently launched a website called Digital Humanities Now. Digital Humanities Now. And it takes advantage of this kind of method of communication, drawing from informally published digital content. So what happens is that digital humanities scholars will publish blog posts of at least over a thousand words for digital humanities now. And digital humanities doesn't wait for those to come to it. What it does is it vacuums them up off the internet. It collects about 400 of these items a day. And then what happens is digital humanities now has written algorithms, ways of analyzing how the community of interest is responding to this blog post. So they'll track, for instance, how many people have linked to that blog from their blog. They'll track how many people tweeted about that blog post, how many people retweeted the tweets. And in a way, what they're doing is they're tracking a kind of peer review, a peer review that's happening before, not after it comes out in some kind of journal. So in this way, articles are being read and assessed not by two or three reviewers, but by a community numbering in the hundreds or thousands. And that's happening after the article has come out, more or less in print, on the web not before it comes out. So what happened is a friend of mine recently gave a paper at a conference and posted the paper the same day to her blog. At the conference, members of the audience tweeted some of her insights as she was presenting them. And then those tweets were shared with others and they retweeted. And then people connected to the paper online from their tweets or from their own blogs. And other people began blogging about that paper and the community of interest and reflection on her topic grew. And within hours, the paper and the presentation were rising to the top of the Digital Humanities Now community list. And then the editors took a look and they decided, do we want to publish this in our journal? And within days of her presentation, my colleague's paper was published in this community-reviewed, then peer-reviewed publication. The main challenge to this kind of scholarly publication is that everything is happening in the open. We're used to carefully preparing our work in the comfort of our audiences and then sharing it with our colleagues and then only then presenting it to the public. And of course we have public lectures or uh, a CBC Ideas series. But the careful boundaries that we've established between our research and the public makes less sense to a new arrival to Congress 2014. In the early years of the internet, so way back, in the early 90s and mid 90s, we thought it was going to be a vehicle for consumption, for a consumer culture. And it is. But we underestimated the degree to which it would be about creation. And we were hearing earlier today about student behavior. Vic Vivek was talking about students and, and the way that they like to create online. So if you take a look at the red slice of this pie, every minute on the internet, 72 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. We also underestimated in the early days of the internet the degree to which it would be about sharing, about connecting with other people. So if you look at the blue, sorry, if you look at the blue slice of this pie, on Facebook, now this is every second, not every minute, every second 41,000 posts are made to Facebook. So that's people telling others what they're up to, looking at what other people are up to. And this is the environment, a world of 96 million Facebook likes in which young scholars are growing up. We live in what Henry Jenkins has called a participatory culture. Lots of people connected with one another creating content. And much of it, I'll admit again, is about cats playing pianos. But there's also good, thoughtful, important stuff in there. Amateur science, citizen journalism, fan fiction writing. James Paul G. has called the producers of this kind of knowledge professional amateurs. These citizen scholars are rarely credentialed or paid. They're doing history or economics or sociology because they love to. And they're intelligent and they're curious and they're motivated. And they claim expertise sometimes in an area where a single researcher or even a small group of researchers might not know much. In the social sciences and humanities, we can do what's already happening in the sciences, where they talk about crowdsourcing research. But we can go beyond getting people to contribute to our research and actually create projects where citizen scholars become co-creators of knowledge with us. 
So what does this look like? If we think back to the early days after the April 15th Boston bombings, the Boston Marathon bombings of about a year ago, scholars at Northeastern University created the Boston Bombing Digital Archive as a place where citizens could add pictures and video and stories and social media about the attacks. So you can see on the day that I grabbed a screenshot of the website, they had featured uh, a child's card that uh, she had created and sent to the police. And you, it's hard to see, but the, the police officer is saying, boss, we caught the crook. And the child's written, you did a, a job, you did a good job. We could say that this is a way of creating new audiences, and certainly it is. But it goes much further than that. It allows for a new kind of relationship with our communities. We never were, of course, mysterious wizards hidden in ivory towers. But even more with these kinds of opportunities, we're especially knowledgeable members of larger communities of interest. Now, of course, this kind of relationship won't make sense in every domain, but I believe it's required in others. In my discipline of history, for instance, if we don't do this, it will be, and it is starting to be done for us by others. So in my own research, I've created iPhone-enabled walking tours of the villages of Niagara and the Lake in Queenston that tourists can encounter, uh, going back to a little bit of what life was like in the early 19th century. And later this year, Google will begin selling Google Glass, augmented reality glasses that provide the wearer with information that's relevant to her time and place. So over this fellow's right eye, you'll see a small screen. So if you go for a walk and you're interested in the history of this mill, on that screen above your right eye, you'll see that it's the Bale Grist Mill built in 1846, and there'll be a speaker behind your ear, and it will tell you the information that you might want to know. Talk about knowledge without boundaries. And how's Google going to market these glasses? With an app that they've called Field Trip. And where does the information for Field Trip come from? Well, Google's an advertising company. So naturally, it's going to come from people who want to sell you things. And I think we could do better. In the next few months, when information's available on our glasses as we walk down the streets, will social sciences and humanities scholars be contributing to it? Will we be integral to the many other spaces where knowledge is being created and shared? And if our work is happening in the open for all to see, will it still be scholarship? If the answer to these questions is even a tentative yes, we need to provide space for new ways of practicing the social sciences and humanities. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we adopt these exact models of research and writing and publishing and communicating, because in a few months, these will already be out of date. As we know, everything's in flux. Nor to be clear, am I saying that we should stop researching in libraries and archives, or stop writing articles, or stop publishing in time-honored journals, or stop communicating via long-established outlets. These ways of being have served us well for generations. But what I am suggesting is that we make room within the academy for both established and new methods. Let's enlarge the boundaries so that a close analysis of our archival sources can be accompanied by a distant reading of millions of books. So that writing and text goes hand in hand with writing with digital maps or audiovisual material. So that publishing with a reflective, intensive, careful, time-intensive peer review goes together with publishing that which is most valuable in an online community. And so the creation of knowledge by scholars alone is accompanied by the sharing or even co-creation of knowledge with citizen scholars. Let's push the boundaries so they make room for both these new and established methods, and let's push those boundaries in a scholarly way. The new paradigm defined around digital media and the internet means that knowledge exists in a world of limitless boundaries. But scholarship, we know, requires borders. We see that tension in our English title, Borders Without Boundaries. So we need to determine what to keep, what boundaries or what borders, sorry, to guard, and what to push past, what boundaries to, to continue and to go against, to break free from. And here the Federation for Social Sciences and Humanities and its association, and specifically you as leaders within your research domains and your associations, can play a special role. When I took a look, and when we celebrate 
one another. We often do it by referring to publications or the number of research awards. But we especially do it by talking about imaginative thinking, about experimental methods, about creative problem solving. What jumped out at me when I ran a word cloud was the word at the bottom, pioneering. When you get beyond the obvious of international work and research and contributions, it's things like pioneering. As academic leaders, you know what borders to guard and which to push past, moving your associations, moving your research fields, taking all of us in directions that we wouldn't otherwise have gone. As the social sciences and humanities move forward in the digital age, we need the wisdom and the guidance of the Federation, its association, you as leaders. We also need you to work alongside those scholars who are experimenting with how we research and write and publish and communicate. They're eager to experiment, but they worry, as we know, about getting hired and tenured and promoted. So let's together ask questions of our practice. Let's together determine where to be imaginative and experimental in our answers. Let's engage together in the critical practice, the critical reflection that has powered the social sciences and humanities in the past and will propel us into the future. Principal Fortier this morning talked about the university of the future needing to be open, connected, personal. The Federation's new mantra is ideas can, and I believe ideas can flourish in the digital age, a world of limitless boundaries. I remember well Brock's last Congress in 1996, and I've got a good idea what it's gonna be like in 2014. So let's imagine what Congress in fact, let's imagine what the social sciences and humanities will look like when Congress returns to Brock in, say, 2032. Let's imagine a social sciences and humanities with scholarly borders but limitless boundaries. Thank you. That was great, Kevin, and very inspiring. But I do have a question. Uh, it actually comes right out of your talking about, about Congress. Because what I've found in the collaborative research that I've done is that scholarship needs bodies. Uh, this, is not a, a, this is not to, uh, to uh, critique anything that you've said, but just to ask you how you integrate the bodies into, into the, uh, the uh, virtual relationship. The breakthroughs that that I've been part of in, in thinking took place when people were together in a room and we kept them in a room, we stayed in the room until we actually made some, something emerged from that. The work that we've done with people in the community, the work that we've done across the boundaries between scholarship and arts, all of that has a embodied element. So I, I guess my question is, how do the bodies fit in? I, I completely agree. And I think the key is what happens when those bodies come together. So I know having watched and, and been a part uh, of, of how you brought people together and the way that you fostered discussion. And I think one of the things that we can do in our associations, one of the things that we can do in Congress generally and is being done, is provide different ways for people to come together. You know, we, we still have a tendency when we go to conferences to listen to paper after paper after paper after paper and to have the opportunity to have questions. And that's really helpful. But I think what we also want to do is provide opportunities for the kinds of things that we call networking, the kinds of things that happen on break, and for people to build while they're doing that. So one of the exciting things that's been happening in digital humanities is we've created what were called that camps. It came out of Dan Cohen's work at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. And and what that camps are are essentially conferences that are almost unconferences. Has anybody been to an unconference? Are we? F yeah. So you know, it, it's a little bit scary when you go because an unconference has a very broad kind of agenda, but no specifics. And people show up, and then what happens over the course of a day or two days 
as they start to define out the terms, they focus on, on what it is that they're really interested in, they identify people there who can speak to the issues, and then they often create something. So they'll be working around a table, trying to build some kind of reflection of their understanding. Sometimes it's, it's a paper, sometimes it's um, something on a 3D printer. So I, I completely agree, the bodies are important, and, and what we do with our bodies when we're together is, is just as important, and that's why I'm really excited about the possibilities. Thank you, my name is Jackie Rourke from McGill University. I work in communications, actually, and I found this very interesting. Um, many academics are eager to explore the new technologies, the new platforms, but between a course load and teaching and research and all the rest, there's very little time to keep up with all of this. Um, in your discussions with other academics who would like to do something a little more novel using the social media, et cetera, have you identified ways that they can be supported or what, what kind of, um, support requests have been coming so that they're given the tools and the training to start engaging in some of these forms of communication. Thank you. One of the things I think digital humanities has to do better and didn't do especially well in the early days was build bridges between our fields and what other people were doing. And part of the reason was we just didn't think about it because we don't think about ourselves as digital humanists. We think about ourselves as literary scholars or historians who just happen to be using computing in a slightly different way. But I think what we're doing now is we're getting better at building those bridges and um, not giving the impression that it's that hard because it's very easy and of course we always fall into this trap of wanting to tell you about how possible everything is. And I've told you about Bill Turkle and Bill Turkle is a genius. I mean, he did his PhD at MIT and he's been programming since he could walk and there's no way that I could even dream to start to be Bill Turkle. Um, so we need to pull back from saying, you know, this is where we need to go and just provide opportunities, small bridges for us to cross. And so, um, you know, I, what many people are doing, what certainly I've done at my own institution is hold workshops, hold seminars, just do small things, bring people into a room and say, really honestly in five minutes, you can do this. Let's just do it together. I think that's the direction that we need to go. We all are doing this already. So it's a matter of, of, of just taking those opportunities when they come, and it's a matter for those of us who have developed a little experience, um, really thinking about building the bridges rather than just doing our own stuff happily. Thank you. Just, if we could just, um, you could join me again in thanking Kevin for his inspirational, engaging, and sobering and scary talk. <laughs> It's great. It's a brave new world.